In the last video, we talked about the rise of Nazi Germany. In the previous video to that, we talked about the history of anti-Semitism. In this video, it's going to be a, a bit long, but we're going to go into the details of the Holocaust. If you see here in the photo, it shows Hitler arriving in Nuremberg in Germany for a Nazi party rally in 1935. The rally was accompanied by mass demonstrations intended to celebrate Hitler, the Nazi party, and Nazi values, which included the purity of the German blood. Mass demonstrations had the effect of creating intense emotional experiences for the participants, which often created the deepened support for Hitler and commitment to his party and goals. The next slides will describe increased persecution of the Jews that took place before 1935 when this rally happened. Then we'll discuss the Nuremberg Laws, which were enacted after this rally. You see here there was widened violence against Jews, a boycott of Jewish businesses, uh, occupational exclusion, so you, you couldn't work here if you're Jewish, that kind of thing. We'll talk about the Nuremberg Laws. Kristallnacht is German for broken glass. They're going to rack up Jewish stores. There is mass arrest and imprisonment of Jews. Uh, many Germans disregarded the boycott of the Jewish stores. They just stayed at home that day of the rally. Uh, then after the boycott, they continued to shop at the stores owned by the Jews. It wasn't all Germany that hated Jews. It was, it was the Nazis that were pushing this onto the people of Germany. For many Jewish shopkeepers, however, the boycott was devastating. Many did end up selling their businesses to non-Jews, then immigrated from the country. The Nazis moved swiftly to deny Jews their livelihoods and their dignity. A larger objective was to motivate German Jews to immigrate, to make them leave. About half of Germany's Jewish population did leave during the Nazi years. But the German government required them to leave their homes, property, and savings behind. You can see here they had a, a law for the restoration of the professional civil service. Uh, Jews were required to resign from civil service. That means they couldn't work for the government. A lot of good jobs are in the government. Um, any jobs with power are usually government jobs. and The Jews could not have those. They were being stripped of their power and livelihoods. They, they couldn't have a job. The Nuremberg Laws were designed to protect the German race in order to implement anti-Semitic policies. The Nazis had to clarify who the Jews were. As already stated, the Nazis considered Jews a race, not a religion. Many Germans, however, had a mixture of Jewish and Gentile ancestors. They're, you know, part Jewish, part Christian. So which one are you? Are you Christian or Jewish? In the Nuremberg Laws, the Nazis clarified how they would categorize different individuals. The Nuremberg Laws also stripped Jews of German citizenship, including the right to vote or hold public office. In addition, these laws criminalized interracial relationships and marriages. The Nuremberg Laws decided who was Jewish and who was not, and it further pushed the persecution of those who were Jewish. The Nuremberg Laws also addressed the identity of children who would be born after the laws were enacted. Status of a Mischling, meaning mixed race, could protect individuals from persecution. Clearly, in the Nazi world, it was better to be a Mischling of the second degree and therefore less Jewish. The 1936 Olympics. Germany had been awarded the 1936 Olympics to host prior to Hitler coming to power and the passage of the Nuremberg Laws. Some nations, including the United States, debated whether to boycott these games because of the situation. Uh, the United States was not happy about the Nuremberg Laws of racial profiling and the stripping of citizenship and the rise of Hitler. But the games did go on. And Hitler hoped the games would be a showcase for the achievements of the Third Reich. That's his German government. However, Jesse Owens, an African-American, won four gold medals and set two 
records, thereby challenging the German racial superiority theory. It looked bad that all these Germans were being beat by a black American. It totally threw off their ideas of racial superiority. In Paris, a Jewish teenager named Herschel Ginitzepen assassinated a German embassy officer. In Germany, Nazis used this incident as a pretext for nationwide violence against the Jewish population. They used that one guy assassinating a German as an excuse to go and get revenge on all Jewish people. Homes, businesses, and synagogues were attacked or destroyed. Tens of thousands of Jews were arrested and put into concentration camps. The Jewish community was also charged a fine of 1 billion marks, that's their dollars, to pay for the damage. Kristallnacht was the first coordinated, organized instant instance of violence against the Jewish community in Germany. It was immediately followed by the complete Germanization of Jewish property and businesses. Germany just went wild on Jewish people, wrecking up all their stops, taking all their things. And it was condoned by the government and the police. Some of the laws listed in this slide were national, while others were merely local. For a Jew in Nazi Germany, it seemed as if every day brought new prohibitions or violence. Some German Gentiles were eager to inform on their Jewish neighbors for violating a law. Jews accused of having failed to comply with a ban on prohibition could be subjected to a house search, arrest, beating, or internment in a concentration camp. The British government eased immigration restrictions after Kristallnacht to allow the rescue of refugee children who are mostly Jews, but some others as well. In 1938 and 1939, 10,000 Jewish children from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia were sent to England by their families. Many would never see their parents again. But unlike many Jews who did not get away from the Nazis, they would survive. Hitler justified the annexation of Austria and then Sudenland, that's western Czechoslovakia, which had a large German-speaking population, by claiming that most of the residents in these areas were Germanic and should thus be incorporated into Germany. The invasion of Poland marks the start of World War I on September 1st. It's all part of his Lebensraum, living space for Germans, more land for Germany. The Jewish Council... Dudenrate, in each city was required to take a census of Jews in their local area, then ensure that Jews were properly deported to the urban concentration points. This resettlement of Jews into cities was the first step in creating ghettos, which are impoverished urban areas that were sealed off from the rest of the city by fences, walls, and armed guards. Nazi orders required that these concentration points be created near jail junk rail junctions by the trains. Later, this would facilitate the transport of Jews to the death camps. We see uh, this quote here from Heydrich in 1939, right after World War II begins. Uh, For the time being, the first prerequisite, For the final aim is the concentration of the Jews from the countryside into a large city. You see the Germans gathering all the Jews together. Theresienstadt, established in the old fortress city of Terezin, just over the German border in what is today Czech Republic, was not like other ghettos. Instead, it was a show ghetto, created largely for the confinement of more prominent Jews. The Nazis used their standards for propaganda purposes, trying to create the impression that Jews were being treated humanely under their rule. However, thousands of Jews were shipped from Theresienstadt to meet their death at Auschwitz. You see... Uh, Warsaw in Poland had the most Jews concentrated. 
A Lord's Head Many, Lvov, Minsk is in uh, Belarus, Amsterdam, and Theresienstadt, the last one here. That was the show ghetto to show that, oh, it's not so bad. But it was. It was quite bad. The men on the Juden raid often were forced with choiceless choices. For example, when the Nazis demanded victims for deportation, the councils had to decide who would go, who would stay. In the ghettos, Jewish police forces helped round up victims selected for deportation. Sometimes the Juden raid were accused of corruption or violence. However, sometimes they struggled to support their population as equitably as possible. Daily lives in the Warsaw Ghetto, the largest ghetto, uh, over twice as many as the next largest ghetto. The Warsaw Ghetto was sealed by high by a high wall on November 15 to 16, 1940. The wall was 11 miles long, 11 and a half feet high, and 10 and a half inches thick. Barbed wires stretched across the top of the wall. Eventually, the ghetto housed close to 450,000 Jews. Fortunate members of the Jewish population were able to secure jobs working in German factories, located in or near the ghetto. Others collected scrap material for the Germans. Smuggling operations, often facilitated by bribery, took place in, connection, in connected buildings that lay on both sides of the ghetto wall, underground canals and through camouflaged openings in the ghetto wall. You see some of the details here about what life in these ghettos would have been like. Uh, six to seven people in, 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 into a room. Uh, thousands died every month. Many could not find a job in the ghetto and would starve. Jews were prohibited from observing the laws of their faith and engaging in worship. However, they continued to secretly practice their religion. These are uh, the Jewish religious leaders in the Warsaw Ghetto. Lud's Ghetto. The Wud's Ghetto was created on February 8, 1940, and sealed off from the rest of the city on April 30, 1940. In December 1941, the first Jews were transported from the ghetto to death camps. They were sent first to Klemno, later to Auschwitz. The quote in this slide is from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum website. Filth was also tremendous. Filth. It was filthy. It was filthy even in the building where we lived. I mean, in the wintertime. I mean, the toilet was, it was, it was ice. It was all ice. And then the faces, the feces and the urine all over was overwhelming, overwhelming there. Terrible conditions. That was a primary document, quote, from someone who experienced this. The author of the quote in this slide describes what people would do to survive. Some would go so far as to deny their own child in order to avoid being killed themselves. This is another primary quote from the Holocaust Memorial Museum website. The German came and they, they lined everybody up. And there was, you know, there this was like in a semicircle. And there was a lady there with a child and... Uh, and he asked, who is this child? And the woman who was the mother says she did not admit the child. So he took the child by his legs and swung it against the wall and killed the child. Extremely inhumane treatment of the Jewish people. The Nazis advanced rapidly across Europe during World War II, but the decision to invade the Soviet Union ultimately turned out to be a key factor in their downfall. The Soviets weathered the invasion and eventually turned back the Nazis after Stalingrad. However, millions of Soviet soldiers and citizens died. German troops also sustained heavy casualties. By the end of the war, the Soviet army managed to drive the Nazi forces back to the heart of Germany.
Einstein Kriepen, were SS and police personnel trained specifically to commit mass murder. Their leaders reported to Reinhard Heydrich, Nazi chief of police and intelligence. The Instatsgruppen operated primarily between 1941 and 1942 in the Baltics and the Soviet Union, where they murdered over a million Jews. By 1942, Germany had conquered or occupied vast portions of both Western and Eastern Europe. The Nazis planned to murder each and every Jew in all of Europe, all these territories. As the Nazis conquered or occupied neighboring countries, Jews were crowded into ghettos or deported to concentration camps or death camps. The difference is concentration camps, they work you to death, and in the death camps, they, they, they will gas you and execute you. Many people know the story of Anne Frank, whose family went into hiding in Amsterdam in an attempt to avoid capture. In the image in this slide, Samuel Sturchever poses by a sign at the entrance to the Jewish quarter in Amsterdam. Strever was active in the Dutch underground, making ID cards for Jews from cards he pickpocketed from the Christian Hollanders. Ultimately, it is estimated that Nazis murdered some 106,000 Dutch Jews. So the Holocaust was happening out of Germany, all across Europe, by the Nazis who had conquered Europe. The Wanna See Conference. This is an important conference the Germans had. It's where they figure out what are they going to do with the Jews. They call it the Jewish problem. And the solution, their final solution, was to have them executed. The Wanna See Conference was the Germans deciding to exterminate all the Jews in all of Europe. SS General Reinhard Heydrich headed several important departments in Nazi Germany, the Secret Security Police, the Security Service, and the Rex Security Main Office. He also directed the work of the Itzengruppe. In January 1942, Heydrich organized the Wannsee Conference. For the conference, Heydrich wanted to gather together the leaders of all relevant German government and Nazi party agencies. He wanted to coordinate the genocide process and assert the authority of the SS over these agencies. Most historians believe that genocide had already been planned and its implementation had already begun before the Wannsee Conference even took place. Whatever the timeline, the minutes from the conference clearly demonstrate the commitment of Nazis to systematically annihilating all the Jews. Official notes from the Vanasi Conference. Under proper guidance in the course of the final solution, that's killing all the Jews, the Jews are to be allocated for appropriate labor in the East, in the course of which action, doubtless, large portion will be eliminated by natural causes. Worked to death. My God. Uh, the possible final remnant will, since it will undoubtedly consist of the most resistant portion have to be treated accordingly because it is the product of natural selection and would if released act as the seed of a new jewish revival state secretary dr burler stated that the general government would welcome if it, it if the final solution of this problem could be begun in the general government dr burler had only one request, to solve the Jewish question in the, this area as quickly as possible. The general government refers specifically to Belzik, Sobir, and Treblinka ghettos. Notice that at no point do the quotes in this slide refer directly to murdering Jews. The Nazis almost always spoke in bureaucratic jargon and euphemisms, such as in the last line, when instead of saying to murder each and every Jew that could be caught, they say to solve the Jewish question in this area as quickly as possible. But they're speaking about murdering Jewish people. The final solution. 
The Nazis called their plan to kill all the Jews the final solution. It was also codenamed Operation Reinhard, after Heinrich. Under cover of war, they isolated, concentrated, and then deported Jews from all over Europe to six camps equipped with gas chambers located in German-occupied and annexed Poland. While historians and researchers have uncovered many memoranda and reports relating to the final solution, no specific order can be traced back to Hitler. However, plenty of secondhand testimony exists showing that Hitler had made it known to Heinrich Himmler and others that he wanted to implement the final solution. In this picture here, you can see the result of the final solution. Mass murder. Himmler explained that this measure was necessary for the ethnic separation of races and peoples. The measure was also intended to protect the security and purity of Germany and to prevent the development of a resistance movement. Major deportations from ghettos across Europe to killing centers began in early 1942, when camps first began gassing Jews. The image in this slide shows Jews being deported from the Lodz ghetto in uh, Poland. Many of these people would die in Chelmo. Later on, the Nazis would ship Jews from the Lodz ghetto to Auschwitz, the largest of the death camps. Testimony of Deportations Deportations were frightening experiences for the victims. Not sure of what was happening, many chose to believe they were in fact being resettled, perhaps in a work camp. As the quote in this slide will show, some victims were subjected to searches. The Nazis loaded deportees into crowded cattle cars or trains. People in the cars would have to travel for days with no food, water, or toilet facilities. This quote is from the United States Holocaust Memorial website. It's a primary document for someone who experienced this. They told us the day before that we can pack one small suitcase and we should be ready to leave the ghetto. When we came to the factory, they started to search us again. The SS was there also, and every woman had to and every girl had to undress naked. And we were searched internally for valuables. My mother was a very religious person, and all I can think of was how terrible this is for my mother to go through something such, such a terrible ordeal. Arriving in Treblinka. Jenkil Wernick escaped from Treblinka in the uprising in August 1943. Miraculously, he was able to hide from the Nazis and eventually, with the help of a sympathetic Christian, he wrote and published his testimony in May 1944. Wernick later settled in Israel and died in 1972. This is quoted from uh, his book One Year in Treblinka in the Death Camp Treblinka. At 4 p.m., the train started to move again, and within a few minutes, we pulled into the Treblinka camp. Only when we arrived there did the full truth dawn on us in all its horror. Ukrainians armed with rifles and machine guns were stationed on the roofs of the barracks. The camp yard was littered with corpses, some still in their clothes and others stark naked, their faces distorted with terror, black and sullen. The eyes were wide open, with tongues protruding, skulls crushed, bodies mangled, and blood everywhere, the blood of innocent people, the blood of our children, of our brothers and sisters, our fathers and mothers. These camps were, were horror. The Nazis stole everything they could from their victims, including clothing, shoes, linens, jewelry, watches, and even women's hair. These items were shipped by train from the concentration camps and death camps back to Germany. Some camp prisoners worked collecting the personal property of victims. They had to sort, count, and pack the items, then prepare them for shipment back to Germany. In addition to shoes, these prisoners also took clothing, coats, wristwatches, and other personal possessions. Camp prisoners, known as gold Jews, were re required to check the teeth of all victims and extract any gold fillings. 
the Germans would then melt down the gold. Gas chambers in the death camp. The victims arrived on trains. They were instructed to strip for showers, and women and girls had their hair shorn. The hair was packed and shipped to Germany for use in mattresses and other items. At Chelno, victims were gassed in mobile vans. At the remaining camps, victims were gassed in showers. Each camp used different methods to dispose of the bodies. Some buried the victims in mass graves, then later exhumed the bodies for cremation. Other camps burned the corpses directly in the crematoria. Testimony of the death in the gas chambers. At most of the camps, the Nazis used carbon dioxide gas to murder the prisoners. But at Auschwitz, Imaginik used cyanide, or Cyclon B, gas to kill the prisoners. Here is a first-hand account. Between 450 and 500 prisoners were crowded into a single chamber measuring 25 square meters. On the way to their doom, they were pushed and beaten with rifle butts. Dogs were set upon them, barking, biting, tearing at them. To escape the blows and the dogs, the crowd rushed to its death, pushing into the chambers, the stronger ones shoving the weaker ones ahead of them. The bedlam lasted only a short while, for soon the doors were slammed shut. The chamber was filled, the motor turned on, and connected with the inflow pipes. Within 25 minutes, at the most, all lay stretched out dead or, to be more accurate, were standing up dead. Since there was not an inch of free space, they just leaned against each other. At several of the camps, the Nazis buried bodies of victims in mass graves. Later, the Nazis exhumed the corpses and burned them in the open on funeral pyres. Many camps also had crematoria, such as those pictured in this slide which had been manufactured specifically to accommodate the large number of dead produced in the camps every day. This is where they would burn the bodies. This selection is from judgment rendered against Nazi officers Kurt Franz and Franz Stagel of the Treblinka death camp. This decision was issued on September 3rd, 1965. Let's see how the Nazis used technology to make the mass murder of the Jews more efficient. Uh, if you read through this quote, it speaks about trains being used to make it as efficient as possible to process thousands and thousands of people in an hour. And you can also see the oven on the left used to burn the bodies. Uh, technology was used by the Nazis to be more efficient and to murder more people quickly. The work camps. At Auschwitz and Medjinik, the Nazis operated industrial plants. Jews lucky enough to escape selection when they first arrived at the camps would work in the plants. In fact, if Jews could survive the first few weeks in the camps, their chances for subsequent survival increased. So they were both death camps and work camps. After they got off the train, some went straight to the gas chamber. Some had to go and get their work detail. Testimony in the work camp. Considerable amount of work prisoners had to do was meaningless. Exhausting physical labor intended only to wear the inmates out. Uh, this quote is, in this slide is from the death camps by William L. Lace. Then the guard leads us to the pile of stones, which we are ordered to carry to another place, about a kilometer away. Loading the bricks and the stones must be done with the greatest of speeds, and then you carry them, and return with the empty carrier running. Over, if, over you, there is an SS guard standing with a horsewhip at the ready, and whoever wants to stretch his back gets a heavy blow. In the quote on this slide, the supervisor was a prisoner placed in charge of the work group. 
or the commando. Her lover in the camp had made an advance at Lily earlier than the day. In order to get back at Lily, the supervisor called Mengele's attention to her. She was selected to be sent to her death in the gas chamber. The quote is from Lena Milieu's memoir, Smoke Over Birkenau. All at once, the work group stopped short. What is it? What's happening? An inspection? No, selection. The women were frantically pulling themselves together, helping each other appear as alert and robust as possible. We were getting closer. Now I could see the German doctor standing beside the officers. It was our turn. We marched up to the gate in time to the music springly, spring, sprightly beat. Mengele's face, as he looked over us, was bland and impassive. This one, the supervisor said, always kaput. She can't do the work. Out, the doctor said simply, waving up the pencil at her. And Lily stepped from the line. She held her arm out. The assistant read off the number, and he wrote it down in this notebook. The number, of course, of the tattooed onto each prisoner's arm. Here's a testimony about roll call. This will be our last slide before the questions. Uh, roll call, or appeal, often lasted for hours, particularly in if there was a discrepancy in the count of prisoners. During lengthy roll calls, inmates might physically support one another because those who fell to the ground could be murdered on the spot or selected for death at another time. Nazis would also use roll call as an occasion to torture or murder inmates who had violated camp rules. Sometimes a camp orchestra or band would be required to perform while prisoners were beaten, hung, or shot in front of the entire population of inmates. The quote on this slide is from Marco Nohon in Birkenau, Camp of Death. To an SS, the roll call is the most important and most ceremonial time at the camp. We are all standing outside in front of the block. The chief of the block then gives the command, Mutsenab, caps off. The block fuhrer leader passes before each block and counts the prisoners. If one or several prisoners are missing, the roll call begins again, and the escape alarm is sounded. These are some questions you'll find in Google Forms.